By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome to the Afton Troll Cup. We've arrived. We are here in Leovarde. And I'm really looking forward to showing you all the matches played at this tournament. Well, all, not all of them, obviously, but the ones played in front of our camera. So we're starting at round one. We're going to go all the way through to the finals. In today's episode, of course, we are starting with that round one match. We've got Auke Koopmans, who is on a mono red disc deck. It's very cool. It's got Hurl Jackals and everything, but more about that in the deck decks. And he's taking on Rob van Dijk. And he's playing with a, a blue, a green aggro deck, you could say. And he's playing with a very interesting card named Force Spike, a full playset. So I'm really looking forward to see that card in action. Now, before I dive into the uh, deck tech section of this video, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also choose to go to the matches straight away, kind of skip the deck techs, check out the decks later. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below, because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. So if you click on there, it'll take you straight to the games. And in that same description below, you can also find more information about the Often Troll Cup, the rules, a link to their Facebook page, etc. Right? So if you want to know more about the event, check out the description below. And it's, it might be nice to, uh, to mention now that this is the biggest old school magic event in the Netherlands. I believe we've got like 90 plus people playing, almost 100 players playing old school magic all in one day, all in one location here in Leeuwarden. So it's it's pretty exciting. It's really nice to be part of this event. Um, and then there's one more thing that I'd like to share with you, and that is, of course, the Timmy Talks Patreon page. So if you enjoy the content that I make, if you like the live streams, if you like the videos, please consider becoming a patron of the show and support the channel financially. The easiest way to do this is by going to patreon.com slash Timmy Talks and check out the page. You can already become a patron for just $1 a month. And for that $1, you get access to the uh, Timmy Talks uh, Discord and also you can join in on all the events that I organize online. So if you're interested, take a moment to check it out and consider supporting the channel financially as well. Patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. Okay, and now that you're fully informed, I'm going to continue with the deck decks. I'm going to start with the deck of Auke, his mono red disc deck. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Auke. So, I mean, this is really red disc, right? Because he's playing with four Neverworld discs. And I mean, the majority of his deck is built around the Nevenerals disc. Uh, usually you see these decks when you play with Nevenerals disc and red, you you tend to go for set troll, often troll, and you kind of play the disco troll deck, black and red. He's chosen to go a different route. So he's chosen to go with Rook Egg with clay statues. There's no black in here at all. So it's really a mono red deck. Let's maybe first look at Nevenerals disc and what that does again. So Nevenerals disc is an artifact for four. That reads, it enters the battlefield tapped, one and tap, destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. It's as simple as that. The cool thing with this card, though, is that if you've got regeneration creatures, you can regenerate them. So, for example, he's playing with clay statues, four to cast, artifact from the antiquities, two to regenerate. It's a three one. So, when you pop the disc, you can regenerate your clay statues. He's also playing with... Um, Mishra's Factories. So Mishra's Factories are not creatures when they're still lands, right? You got to animate them into factory workers. So you can pop the disc and the disc is going to destroy all the artifacts, enchantments and creatures, but not lands. After that, you can animate your factories and swing in with your factories, right? They're not affected by the disc. So that's just another trick. Then he's also playing with Rook Egg. So Rook Egg is your ideal creature to combine with the disc, right? Because it's an O3 creature that actually wants to die. Because when it gets destroyed, you get a 4-4 red bird creature token at your next end step. So basically at the end of your turn, you get like a 4-4 token, which is really sweet. For example, at the in the end step of your opponent, you pop the disc, everything gets destroyed, and then you get your bird token, and then when it's your turn, you can attack with your 4-4 bird token, right? That's a huge advantage. So there's a, a lot of synergy here happening with the Nevenerals disc, and there's a card in here, and I think it's so funny. He's playing with Hurl Jackal, and Hurl Jackal is just this 1-1 card from Arabian Nights that does something that's not really used that often. Tap and target creature cannot be regenerated this turn. So I guess Aug is expecting to see a lot of often trolls because we are at the often troll cup. Oi, oi, oi. And with the Hurl Jackal, he can kind of take out that regeneration ability of the trolls. So that's quite nice, right? What I also really like in this deck is the combination between Chain Lightning and Rook Act. That's pretty cool because Chain Lightning is basically this 
bad lightning bolt, right? It's a sorcery for one red from legends, deals three damage to any target, but then it has this chain ability where you can pay two red and you can cast it again. So if you're the target of chain lightning, you can pay two red and then you can deal three damage to any other target. So if you have a rook egg, you target your own rook egg, then you're the target. You can pay two more red, target another rook egg if you have it, or use that other three damage to deal three damage to your opponent or destroy a creature at the side of your opponent. So chain lightning and rook egg is a really good combination. It's just a lot of value for one little one mana sorcery spell that you're basically getting back. So that's pretty sweet. Hopefully we get to see that chain in action. Another card that he's playing with that I'm quite excited about is fork. Fork is two red to cast and it can copy any instant or interrupt and uh, or sorcery. And, and fork is just really good in in these um, uh, Swedish formats because a lot of people today are packing their full power, right? They're bringing their ancestral recalls to this event, their time walks, and you can copy those with your forks. Also, you can copy a mind twist, which is quite fun, right? Oh, you want to twist me? I'm actually going to twist you also. <laughs> you know, So you can have these really silly situations with fork. And of course, with fork, you can counter the counter spell by forking it, which is quite cool. So I'm looking forward to see fork in action. And I guess in his own deck, he can, for example, fork his lightning bolt, maybe for lethal, do stuff like that. So fork, in my opinion, still a little bit underestimated. Uh, as a card, it doesn't see that much play lately, but I think it's much better than a lot of people think, especially in Swedish old school, because there's simply so much power everywhere and so many restricted cards are being played that are well worth copying. Okay, this is the deck of Auken. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Rob. And here we see the blue-green deck of Rob, and I'm really liking this combination. I'm just a big fan of Tropical Island, and I think blue and green, I can kind of, you know, water and, and nature, plants, I, I can see that work, you know, I think it's really cool. Um, and when we look at the deck, we see some classical combinations, right? Basically, what you want to do is your turn one Lanora Elves, turn two, you want to do your Ice Storm, or maybe even better, cast your Surrender Pafrit, the 3-4 Flyer from Arabian Nights, you know, deal some damage early on. He's also playing with Scavenger Folk. I mean, Scavenger Folk goes together quite well with that Land Denial plan with Ice Storm, because you need to have a weapon against the Moxen. It's as simple as that. In a field like we have today, we're going to see a lot of Moxen. He's actually playing with a lot of Moxen himself as well. You need, if you want to go on that Mana Denial plan, you need a plan for that Artifact Manas, and he's got, he's got a big plan because he's playing and with scavenger folk and with crumble so it's quite aggressive in this matchup that basically means bad news for alka and his neveneral's discs because he's got a lot of answers to those there's another answer in his deck that i really like because you don't see that card so often but when it works it's so efficient it gives you such a good feeling and that card is four spike so four spike one blue for an interrupt from legends that says counter target spell unless its controller pays one it's like a mini power sink now it's difficult to pull this off, right? I mean, Force Spike can feel really good early in the game, but later in the game, it's terrible. Also, once your opponent knows that you have Force Spike, he's going to try to play around this. Um, now, this is a good thing and a bad thing, I guess. The nice thing is your opponent is slowing himself down, which is pretty sweet. Um, but the bad thing is that he knows about it, so he's probably just going to keep mana open. That means that there are dead cards in your hand, and he's playing with a full playset. So I wonder, and maybe we'll never know, but I wonder if Rob is going to use his four spike in game one, if he then is go going to board it out for game two and three, because his opponent knows, and then you have this advantage of your opponent still keeping an extra mana open, but you're no longer playing with the spike, right? So you've got like double advantage, which is, which is kind of funny. You're slowing your opponent down for a card that you no longer have in your deck, but that's of course kind of the beauty of uh, sideboarding. We don't see any regular counter spells here in the deck. We do of course see the full blue power, I think. This is just looking like like a good like a good strong deck. There's one other card that I want to mention. He's only playing with the one of, but it's cool to see it in the deck. Psychic Purge. So Psychic Purge is this sorcery from uh, Legends. Also just one blue. It pings. It deals one damage to any target, right? Sometimes that can be quite nice. So he can use this to to take care of a Hurl Jackal or maybe to take care of one of the clay statues if he doesn't have enough mana open to regenerate it. So that that could be quite nice. Um, but also when a spell or ability an opponent um, controls causes you to discard the purge, that player loses five life. So this card is quite popular in formats where you can also play with Fallen Empires because then you've got your him to Turex and stuff. Um, but I guess in this matchup that's not very relevant. Although. Although, wait a minute, he is playing with the Wheel of Fortune. So if Alka wheels Wheel of Fortunes and he has a Psychic Purge, 
That could be a funny moment in the game. Anyway, we'll just have to uh, wait and see if that happens. This is the deck of Rob. We've looked at the deck of Auke and that means we are ready. Let's go to round one of the Often Troll Cup 5. Game number one, here we go. We've got Auka on the left with his Mono Red Nevenerals Disc deck and he's taking on Rob. He's sitting on the right with Blue Green Aggro. Let's see. Oh, we've got a Library of Alexandria here as the opener for Auka at the tournament. That is huge. Now remember, Rob is playing with four Ice Storms, so maybe he can find the answer next turn. There's a lot of where else on turn one, so also a good start for him. If he has that Ice Storm, Hauke counting cards should be seven, exactly using the library. So already has some value out of that library. There's a mountain. Probably gonna pass or not. Gonna bolt here the Lanaward. That's actually a good decision. Ending up on six cards. Next turn he can draw seven and use that library again. There's a Pendlehaven and a pass. We can kind of see the hand of Rop. I see a Crumble, a Suchi, some blue cards in there. Not sure if there's a Force Spike. Really looking forward to see that spike in action. There's a Mox Ruby being picked up by Auka. So, I mean, things are really looking looking good for him because of that Loa, of course. So much value with that card on the battlefield. And Rob really needs to find a way to or put pressure on or get rid of the, um, of the Loa. But here is that Strip Mine. That is devastating, actually. That's really going to set him back. I mean, after turn one, he was in this position where he could possibly play an Ice Storm turn two, but then there was that Bolt on the Lanaware, and now that Strip Mine on the Duel, really setting Rob back. And every turn that he set back, every turn that Loa works, it means double the amount of cards for Auka. So Auga's going to play out a Factory here, probably going to use the Loa again. <coughs> He's going to tap, going to go to eight. Has the Hurl Jackal now, Chain Lightning in hand, Mox Ruby in hand. Already had a land drop, tapping one. There's a Hurl Jackal. So this is the 1-1 one, one from Arabian Nights that you can tap to take away regeneration of a creature. And no lands in hand for Rob. That is tough, has to pass now. Three is really kind of the magic number for him, right? If, if he can get to three, he can play like Surrendip and stuff like that, but it's not there. I mean, it's looking really good for Auka. <laughs> There's another land, probably has seven in hand now. Can just use the Loa. Gonna go back up to eight again. Animating, attacking. Are we gonna see that crumble now? There is a quick crumble. Attacking with the Jackal. So Rob's gonna drop to 19. Could now draw that extra card, play the Mox Ruby for turn which is still in the hand. Playing the Ruby, passing the turn, so seven in hand for Auka. And there we have another crumble here. So Rob, of course, taking damage from his own City of Brass. There's a Scavenger Folk, so even more artifact removal, but not really what he needs right now. So this is an interesting moment, right? He's using his Pendlehaven to cast a Scavenger instead of the City of Brass, perhaps signaling that he has some kind of action to do still with that one mana open there is a quick lightning bolt though and hey there we go there is the force spike oh <laughs> and you see out like what's that well this is force spike nice i'm already happy you know seeing force spike in action countering a bolt which is pretty cool i mean it's not really going to help it up that much it really needs to take care of that library of alexandria of course but Hey, it's, uh, it's at least a good feeling, you know? You're like, okay, I cast a Force Spike, and it was successful. So Auka now uh, looking at the Scavenger Folk, considering if he wants to attack or not, I assume. And he does. I think it's a good decision. You can trade resources as long as you've got that Loa, because that's going to give you so much advantage. Tapping one red. There's a Chain Lightning now on the scavenger folk <laughs> and there's a pass Seven. Yes. or not is he going to do something still okay he didn't have a land drop yet of course so there's the mountain for turn passing and i mean the only good news finally three mana there's a surrender of so no ice storm but there is a surrender that can put some pressure on 
And what I wanted to say is the good news here for Europa is that despite the fact that Aukes had this low of from turn one, I mean, he's still on 15. You know, maybe he can get somewhere. Aukes hasn't really managed to put too much pressure on the life total of Rob. So it looks like he's going to attack here with the Hurl Jackal. He's going to block, so we're probably going to see that bolt. So this is a two for one. There's the land for turn. I mean, what he could have done as well is, you know, play the Rook Egg instead. But then again, it would mean he would take three damage. But that would have been an option. He could have bolted his own Rook Egg and get a 4-4 four, four Flyer to block that uh, Surrendip. There's an Urnum Jin, 4-5, hitting the board. So quite a lot of Arabian Nights uh, creatures in the deck of Rob with the Urnum Jin and the Surrendip. Drawing card for turn, there's that Nevenerals Disc. So now what he could do is get this situation going where he has the Disc and the Rook Egg together in play. Oh, this is really good. Mistress Workshop. That means it's really cheap now to cast that Nevenerals Disc. Gonna go for the Disc. And then next turn, probably go for the Ag, and then he can also pop the disc, counting the cards, making sure he doesn't have to discard. Passing the turn here. So at least Rob has one swing, right? He can swing in with the Urnum. There's also a Suchi in hand. The question is, do you want to cast that now with that disc on board? There's the attack for four. Going to set Auka back to 16. First damage for him. There's the untap for Auka, untapping the disc as well. So now he's got that disc factor. Going to go back up to seven, draw card number eight. He's got some lands there, exactly dropping a land for turn. Now he's got enough land to and play the Rook Egg and pop the disc whenever he wants to. Also, of course, has that Blood Moon, which would be pretty devastating for Rob, but you don't want to play the Blood Moon now that you've got the disc on board, right? So he's kind of looking at his options. He could also pop the disc and then cast the Blood Moon. That's another option. Remember, Rob has actually three non-basic lands that will turn into mountains, which is really bad for him. Tapping four. What are we going to see for four? Oh, there's a clay statue. Interesting choice here. Of course, the clay statue can block the Urnum Jin and gets Forest Walk. There's the Sylvan, or not. You can see Rob thinking, hmm. Then again, I mean, you want to force your opponent to pop that disc at a certain moment in the game, right? The question is, do you wanna wanna put your Sylvan under the bus, basically? We see Aukir blocking the Urnum with the clay statue, so it's regenerating the statue for two. And of course, the statue now has Forest Walk, right? So remember that. The thing is, though, Rob doesn't have any forest. Now that I look at it, he's got the Pendlehaven and the Sea of Brass. Doesn't have forest. Now we do see that Sylvan. I think it's a good decision by Rob because he's already seen the Sylvan. That's A. And B, I mean, you don't want to be taken hostage by this disc because that's exactly what a disc player wants to do. So just try to force him to pop the disc, keep some resources in hand. I mean, this is a pretty tough game one anyway for Rob with that Loa. So... If I, if I were him, I would see every turn now as a bonus because you get to know the deck of your opponent and you can make better choices when sideboarding. You're, the chances that you lose the game is like 90% with that Loa from game one. Anyway, there's the attack with the clay statue. Three damage for Rob, going to drop to 11. And I still wonder if you're, out, if you're considering popping the disc because do you want to give him that Sylvan activation? Then again, I mean, he's on 11... If he finds an Ice Storm, Ice Storm's the Loa, that's fine. You've had so much, so many cards out of that Loa anyway. Remember, it's been active since since turn two for Auga, so it's, it's, it's given him a huge advantage. He's got a Soaring in hand. But you can kind of see him think, right? Because every time he's got to think, if I'm going to play this out, it's also going to destroy, being be destroyed eventually by my disc. I would consider playing out the Rook Egg here because it's a great blocker for the Urnum. And if you pop the disc, it's also fine. Tapping four. Yep, there we see the Rook Egg. So an 3 creature. And when it's destroyed, you get a 4-4 bird token in your next end step. So it works together really well with the disc. So this is really nice for Aoki. He's kind of in, in full control. 
passing to turn here. I always find that the tough thing with the disc is, you know, to cast it at the right moment that it cannot be countered. And also, of course, to make sure that it can stick on the board because usually opponents play with or counter spells or disenchants or shatters. So, or crumbles, I guess, in the case against the rope. So it's always kind of tough to get to that moment where you can untap your disc. As soon as your disc is untapped, you're kind of safe. You kind of have that control. But to get to that moment, that's actually kind of tough. Anyway, we see Tropical Island here being dropped by Rob. At least he got the activation, so he's going to get Forest Walk to the Rook Egg. Now he can keep the Urnum untapped to potentially block the uh, Clay Statue. Okay, he is going to attack here. Interesting. Or not. Is he not going to attack? Changed his mind. I mean, if he attacks, we're going to see a block by the Rook Egg, right? So you're basically giving him the... A 4 4 bird token. So I wonder what his thought process is here. He's thinking about animating. Okay, tapping a blue, animating the factory as well. So quite aggressive move here, attacking for six. Kind of forcing Auki here to use his disc. But then again, I mean, Auki's got some options. He can animate his own factory. Block the factory if Rob pump his own factory, make it a 3-3, try to kill the Mishra's factory, and he can block, use the Rook Egg to block the urn and basically get a 4-4 flyer. Or he can, of course, pop the disc, but that does mean that he will lose his clay statue. He doesn't have enough mana to regenerate the statue. Or, of course, take two damage from the factory and block the urn with the Rook Egg. Which doesn't seem like a very bad exchange for him. Just two points of damage for a 4-4 flyer. But I'm sure, I mean, if you're out, you're thinking, why is he attacking? What does he want to do here? So taking two damage from the factory, blocking the Urnum Jin. So he's going to get that 4-4 eventually. Remember, it happens at the next end step. So the next end step in this case is the end of the turn of Rob. So that 4-4 will not have summoning sickness. He can start swinging in with it directly. The rope, of course, being on 7. So it looks like he can kill Rob next turn. Unless he does something. He's got a Lanawer Elves, I believe, as well. Exactly, playing out the Lanawer. Together with the Pendlehaven, he could pump it into a 2-3. He has another Lanawer he could play out as well. Does mean he would drop to 6, though. Unless he, of course, uses his Pendlehaven. That's another option. Exactly. Uses the Pendlehaven. Ooh, untapping again. Really really in the tank here. I think Rob was really hoping to see that disc activation. So really stuck in the mud here, you know. I think all options for him are bad at the moment because of that 4-4 flyer. Playing another Lanawer. There we see the 4-4 Bird token coming into the game. So he's going to untap. Draw for turn. Does he have 7 in hand again? I believe so. So then he can draw an extra card again <laughs> with that Loa. And that Loa is doing so much work. It's ridiculous. There he goes. Another disc. The thing with the Loa, I don't know if you recognize this, because, I, you know, when you play it and you've got it since turn one, you kind of feel like that you have to win because you've got so much card advantage. And I tend to actually go and play slower because, A, I feel like I have to win with that Loa, right? And, B, I have more options in my hand. So it's just, you, if you have more options, you need more time to think, basically. So sometimes people think, okay, why don't you hurry up because you're already winning. Uh, but, yeah, because you're winning, you're afraid of losing, and you've got more options with more cards, so you take longer. At least, that's how it works for me. And now Auka also still in the tank. He could, of course, attack here with the 4-4 Flyer. Uh, put him on 3 and maybe keep the Clay Statue for blocking. I mean, if he attacks with the Clay Statue, you're forcing your opponent to block with one of the Lanawer Elves. But that doesn't really matter much for him. And then you've got to invest 2 more mana to regenerate your Clay Statue. So 
So Auka really here taking his time, trying to figure out how not to lose at this point. Attacking here for four. He's going to put him on three. Does he have a bolt in hand or a chain? Then he can win. I don't think so. He could go, but it's quite risky. He could go for wheel. You know, he's got um, a soul ring there. He could drop soul ring, then tap another red and the soul ring, play wheel of fortune, and kind of assume that he's going to draw into a bolt. I do think it's... I, I think I would be a bit more conservative, to be honest. I would probably just pass the turn here and, and pop the disc. If he animates the factory in the text with everything, for example, I would pop the disc. Because then you can still regenerate the clay statue. Okay, tapping three here. Okay, there's a Jalem Tome. Okay, so he can use, of course, also the Tome to try to get... Okay, there's a sword. He's going to empty his hand here. So does that mean he's going to play out the um, the wheel? I think he's going to do the wheel. There's the Wheel of Fortune. I mean, I have to say I do like it, Auka. I like it. I'm just not sure if I would have done it. Because you are giving your opponent seven new cards and you are already winning. And maybe you are going to find... You're not going to find your bolt or chain. And maybe you whiff and you just find like seven lands in hand. I mean, it does happen. And no bolt, no chain. We do see a fork for what it's worth. But uh, no bolt, no chain. Actually a pretty bad hand. I mean, another disc when you already have one on the board. Does have enough mana to use his Jalem Tome again. So Jalem Tome card from Antiquities. Draw a card, discard a card. Yeah, he is going to use the book. He's really searching for that one bolt. There's a Blood Moon. Blood Moon's still pretty good. Problem, of course, is Blood Moon kind of deactivates his own Library of Alexandria. And Rop has those Lanawar Elves. So I think this Wheel of Fortune actually, you know, put him in a worse position than he was before casting it. I understand the decision because remember, he's playing four bolts, four chains. So there's a pretty big chance that you find a chain lightning or a lightning bolt and you can win it on the spot. You don't have to give your opponent the extra turn. But now that he hasn't managed to do so, it is pretty risky. Also, of course, um, allowing Rob here to look at three fresh cards because he just drew seven. There's a Crumble. Interesting. Could go for Crumble on the disc to see what he does. I'm, I don't even know if that's a good decision to make here, but you want to get rid of the Flyer, right? So probably you first want to attack and then play the Crumble and just see what he does. He also has a Surrendip, so he, he can play the Surrendip to block. If he has two Surrendips, he could play both of them to double block the Flyer. Then he, he, he is on three, of course. Ah, oh, it's so difficult when you're so low. You don't want to use your City of Brass anymore. You don't really like your Surrendip of Fritz anymore, because remember, they deal one damage to you during your upkeep. You can, you can end up killing yourself very easily in this scenario. Okay, there's a Mox Pearl. There is the land drop for turn, another factory. Okay, that's not too shabby. What else does he have? I mean, those Surrender Pafrites, they're awesome, of course, but they always feel so awkward when you're in the stage of the game when your opponent starts dropping the 4-4 Flyers, right? Because at 3-4 is just not big enough. I guess that's why I like Unstable Mutation or Giant Groves in these decks as well. They do take a slot, so it's difficult to make space, but... There's the attack here for 6. No, changing his mind. It looks like he has animated it, though. So Rob, really, really in the tank here. What to do? He's on three. That's the problem for him. I would consider playing that crumble on, on the disc and kind of, you know, see what happens. Maybe he pops it. I mean, who knows? And then, then your flyer is gone. And he doesn't have enough mana as well to also regenerate the clay statue. Anyway, the attack here first. 
So animating the factory, remember he can also pump it to a 3-3. So if he doesn't block at all, he's going to take 8 damage. He would drop to 6, which is still pretty safe. I mean, you should be worried about a psionic blast, right, when you're playing against blue deck, so that's 4 damage. So when you're on 6, you would end up on 2, which is not ideal, but you still survive. You just have to make sure that you can kill your opponent next turn, which I guess is a pretty big if. So Aoka really looking at the battlefield like, oh, what to do? I mean, he could use the clay statue exactly to block, but then he has to regenerate it. And then there's this opening for Rob to use this crumble, where he could go crumble on statue or crumble on disc. And there's no mana open for Alka. Then again, the disc and, and the statue are not the problem. The problem is that 4-4 four, four flyer. So he has this Surrendip in hand as well, right? So he has to keep three mana to play the Surrendip in second main. Anyway, there's the attack. Let's see what he blocks. Blockers are declared. He's not going to regenerate. Interesting. Only going to take three, so he's blocked the Urnum. Tapping two. Tapping three. Are we going to see the Surrendip? There's the Surrendip Jin, 3 4. Yeah, this was as to be expected. But this, I mean, this is starting to become a problem here for, for Auka. I mean, I don't know how he got himself into this spot, but he, he needs, he just needs a bolt or a chain, it's done, but if, if he cannot find it, because how many cards does he have in hand? Does he have enough cards here? Does he go up to seven? Can he then use, oh, there's the chain lightning. Yep, then it's over. Then it's over. I mean, first counting the cards also has that fork. Yep, that's it, chain lightning. So eventually he found the chain and the bolt, but let me know in the comments below if you would have played the wheel. I do love the wheel. And remember, he's got eight cards, right? Eight, four bolts, four chains in there that, that can win in the game. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I kind of felt like after that wheel, he was worse off. Then again, you never know what hand you're going to get from the wheel, right? Anyway, this was game one. Very, very exciting. I love to see these decks because they've got some really original cards in there. Uh, both of the players are going to dive into the sideboards and we are going to catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. Now, of course, Rob being on the play here after losing that first game. Ooh, soaring in hand there for Auka. That's good. Let's see what the rope can do. There's his land drop. Ooh, starting with a factory. Interesting. So no Lunar or Elves turn one. Also no blue for a four spike. There's the soaring passing the turn. Are we going to see a crumble? Let's see what he can do. There's a forest. And there we go. There's the crumble. Makes sense. Does mean that Auka's going to go up to 21. He's still on 11. <laughs> from game one, I assume, but should go back up to 21. I'll try to keep the scores in check for you. And there is, ooh, Black Lotus. Are we gonna see some quick pressure? Cracking the Lotus. Scavenger folk, and an Ice Storm here. Wow, so really going for aggression, tapping the red. Are we gonna see a bolt on the Scavenger folk? That's the question. And there's also a regrowth. Getting back the ice storm. Ooh, this is looking super aggressive. There is the bolt there on the scavenger folk. So some very aggressive magic there. There's the pass. And there is again the ice storm. So playing both of those ice storms out. Really taking care of the mana base, also crumbling, of course, that soul ring earlier in the game. There's a Mishra's factory, another land found. No blue, though, for Rob. Oh, and look at that, it looks like he boarded in his city in a bottle. Does it mean that he boarded out 
his Arabian Nights creatures. So, of course, Sidney Nabala works great against the Loa and the Hurled Jackals, but there's not really a lot of Arabian Nights in the deck of Auka. So, I don't think he really minds the bottle that much. There's the animation. Gonna attack here, offering basically a trade. Should go here to 19, so forgot that one life from the crumble. Dropping to 18. There's a pass. That is pretty bad here for Auka. Needs those lands. And now we've got a Chaos Orb. I'm expecting him to flip here on the mana. There he goes. Gonna flip on the factory, exactly. Like this is once you've kind of decided, okay, flip on the mountain. But once you've kind of decided to go that route of land destruction, you usually use your Chaos Orb as a land destruction spell as well. And I think it's a good decision, by the way, to go for red. Just make sure that you cannot even cast the bolts. But now there's that Mox Ruby. Not playing it out, very clever, keeping it in hand until he has a, a plan for it. Knowing that he can lose it instantly to a crumble. There's the attack, putting Auk on 16. There's a pass. Now he's got that bolt in hand. I believe he's got eight cards, right? So he could now consider playing out the ruby. Exactly, keeping the ruby there. Ooh, there's an ice storm though. So there's a quick ice storm on the factory. Factory is gone. There's a pass. So Rob now fully focusing on that land destruction plan and it seems to be working quite well. There we see Alka forced to discard a card. There's the City of Brass animating, attacking for two. Now we're probably going to see the bolt. Exactly. Take care of business. And there is the Surrender Befreed 3 4 Flying Powerhouse. It's going to do some business. Hey, there's the Loa again. And now I wonder if you're Rope, do you want to play your City in a Bottle? Because I think it's a City in a Bottle in hand, right? Or was I wrong? Because he kept the Surrender Befreed. So I thought maybe he boarded out Urnums and Surrenders and has this sideboard plan. Looks like he didn't though, attacking here. And now he's at an interesting junction. Oh, there's a time walk. That makes it easy. You can just take an extra turn. No red elemental blast here for Auka. He's gonna take an extra turn. Let's see what he can find. There's an ice storm. Oh, this is perfect. He can just ice storm the Loa. Doesn't have to make the tough decision with the city in a bottle. He can just Ice Storm attack for three. Gonna put Auk on ten. Oh, it's looking really bad. It's looking really bad here for Auk in game number two. Just has to pass. And this is, of course, where the four toughness of the Surrender really works well. Auk cannot chain or bolt it. There's another City of Brass attacking again, putting Alka on 7, passing the turn. And I believe there are two City Nibalos now in hand of, of Rob, by the way, if I'm not mistaken. Which I very well could be. There's also, is that a Control Magic in hand there, and a City in a Bottle, and now a Blue Elemental Blast. So three cards in hand in total. Anyway, attacking here, putting Alka on 4. Alka needs a Miracle, at least finding another red mana. Can he do something? Could consider casting the Blood Moon just because. I mean, what else can he do? But Blood Moon is not going to save him. Problem here is that Neverno's Disc is 4 and comes into play tapped. Oh, he's got the Jalem Tome as well. I didn't see that one. Of course, a better option to go for Jalem Tome, hoping that he can maybe find another Chain Lightning. Play Double Chain, for example, on the Surrendip next turn. There's the attack. Going to go to 1. One measly life point. Now remember, Rob also has that blue elemental blast to counter. Exactly, there's the second chain, so he can go for double chain, but there will be that blue elemental blast. Oh, there is. Oh, the problem here is that he doesn't have enough mana. I thought that he had a double chain lightning, so wasn't quite sure why he used the Jalem Tome. Firing off the red elemental blast. There's the blue elemental blast, and that is game number two here for Rob. But uh, yeah, wow, quite interesting to see how that went. I mean, the, the land destruction plan of Rob really did some overtime here in game number two and, uh, and eventually gave him the, uh, the game here, not the match, because we have a third game ahead of us. Game number three, here we go. So 
Aoka on the play, starting with a mountain, passing to turn to a drop, starting with an island. Let's see what game three will bring us. There is a strip mine, not using it though. Well, he is using it, but not to strip a land. He's gonna play out a Chaos Orb. Let's see what Aoka can do here, playing another mountain. Tapping, okay, there we see his own Chaos Orb. Could, cons could have considered flipping his Chaos Orb on the Chaos Orb of Rub, instead giving him the option. So Rob in the tank here. I don't think he's got any green mana. He does have that Lana or else. That would have been a great turn one play, but no green mana for him. Look at that, just passing the turn. Ooh, this is bad news for him. Automatically making it good news for Aoki. Cannot really take advantage of just passing the turn. Both of these players, by the way, have... Well, we see a red elemental blast in Aoki's hand. I wanted to say a blue blast in the hand of Rob, but it looks like he doesn't. There's the green mana he was waiting for, by the way. Pendlehaven into Lunarer Elves. There's a quick lightning bolt answering the threat. And it's gone. Yeah, we do see a blue elemental blast there in hand for Rob. So we could have a little red elemental blast, blue elemental blast battle going on. There's another one. Tapping a green. There's a scavenger folk. And this scavenger folk, I like it because it's putting Alka in this awkward scenario. You really don't want to use your Chaos Orb for a scavenger folk. No, there's no orb up yet. Right? I mean, you could also wait until Rob activates the scavenger folk. So he is going to flip. And in response, Rob's going to flip. So basically, you're taking out the, the Chaos Orbs out of the game here. Oh, it's the missed flip, though. This is great for Aoki. Get some extra value. Oh, this flip could turn out to be quite expensive. Going to go for the green mana source, of course. Oh, also misses the flip. Both players here are missing the flip. And you can still see Aoki shaking his head like, what am I doing here? This could have been pretty huge, actually, because you're taking away Pendlehaven, which is huge. And also, then he can no longer activate the scavenger folk. Oh, man. Anyway, here we see a Surrender being cast by Rob. Quick Red Elemental Blast. No mana open here for Rob to cast his Blue Elemental Blast. But what a moment in the game this was. And I feel that Rob's kind of... Or, or Auk is kind of behind now and Rob's ahead. There's another attack. Problem here, obviously, for, for Rob is his lack of lands. But he doesn't need much. I think three mana is kind of enough for his deck to work. There's four. Okay, there's a Rook Egg. There's a counter spell, though, with the blue elemental blast, which makes sense because it means he doesn't get a counter. Or doesn't get a token, I mean. Doesn't get the 4-4 token because he's countering the spell. I mean, he did have that earthquake in hand. Now he's going to play the earthquake for one to kill both scavenger folks. So that's some value. That's pretty decent. But yeah, obviously it would have been much better for, for Aokir to end, you know, kill his own egg and destroy the two scavengers. That would have been sick, but didn't happen. There's the pass by Alka. Is he going to animate the factory? It looks like he is. Going to attack for two. Going to put Alk here on 15. There's the pass. Okay, there's something. But now, of course, Rob can use his Ice Storm to take care of that. Factory probably wants to play a Surrender instead of that. Could also use... Okay, it's going to animate. Interesting. Offering a trade, taking the trade. Oh, there's the crumble. I was like, why is he doing that? So crumbling before blockers are declared. There's the pass. Can attack again for two. And Auken not finding any bolts. There's a scavenger folk passing the turn. Okay, there's a bolt. So perhaps next turn, if Rob animates. There's a city animating, attacking probably. Or not. I mean, does he have other options? He still has the Surrendip in hand. Can, of course, counter the Bolt. Okay, gonna tap three here. He's gonna play the Surrendip, it seems. Gonna play... Oh, or not. What was the other option? What was the other option? Okay, he is gonna play the Surrendip of Freet. And he's gonna attack for one and pump here. 
I mean, this is looking really bad for Auka. Auka could have considered playing the Bolt here on the Scavenger. Now we can go for Chain and Bolt, which is risky. Oh, this is much, much better. City in a bottle coming probably in from his sideboard. This is pretty huge. Destroying here two permanents on the side of Rob. City of Brass and Surrender Perfreet. This is a great comeback here for Auka. And there's also the Chain Lightning on the Scavenger Folk. The good news for Rob though is that he still has his factory to attack with. And the Ice Storms in hand just look really, really bad now because there's so much mana available for Auka. They did a great job for him. Ooh, there's a Bolt. Blue Elemental Blast. They did a great job for him in uh, game number two, but now they just seem to uh, fill, uh, fill up space. What's that other blue card in there? Could it be a Psionic Blast? Whoa, there is a, uh, a Strip Mine here. A strip on the Mishra's Factory. That's unfortunate. And now he's going to play an Ice Storm just because he doesn't have any better options. So, I mean, it's looking good for Auka. The problem is he's on seven. There's another Ice Storm. Yeah, what, what else to do, really? Ooh, there's a Red Elemental Blast. That's also pretty huge. Another mana passing the turn. He cannot play it out. Exactly because of the City in a Bottle. That's exactly what... What Rob is pointing out here as well, like the City in the Bottle is blocking him here, and both players are kind of blocked by this card. There's a lot of Elves. Now the cool thing about Rook Egg though is once you've got your Rook Egg on board and then you play your City in a Bottle, you know, the Rook Egg gets destroyed and you get a 4-4 token, the token is not destroyed by City in a Bottle. So that's some, some nice synergy there. But now that City in a Bottle is already in play, you cannot play out any Arabian Night, Night cards at all, even if you want to. Aoki are uh, dropping to 5, by the way. So this Lanor Elf could be the game decider. We do see an Earthquake in hand. He's going to play an Earthquake for 1 here. Exactly. Does mean Aoki's going to drop to 4. There's a Psionic Blast, but he's got that Red Elemental Blast, right? Exactly, there's the Red Elemental Blast. Ho, 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 ho. So Rob kind of felt like, I'm here now. I got you on 4. But he was able to counter it. And another Psionic Blast gives him the game. Okay, Rob winning here, winning the match here, winning game three. And I, I still kind of feel like that flip moment in the game was kind of huge, but yeah, wow. So Rob winning here uh, the first match. And I have to say, this was this was a good one. Really cool decks to see in action. Very, very nice. Congratulations, Rob, for winning here the first uh, match here at the Upton Troll Cup. And of course, we will be back with more action from the Upton Troll Cup. Next time we have this match for you, Robots by Philco taking on the Beast Island deck of Richard. So if you don't want to miss a thing, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Okay, and before you go, also please consider leaving a like, a comment and share this on your socials. All these things are free and really help the channel move further. So thank you so much for doing that. And of course, don't forget to check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash TimmyTalks to find out how you can become a patron of the channel and support the show. One of the nice perks is if you become a patron, your name will be mentioned at the end of every single video in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll.
Samba Kazik.